Welcome to Lecture 9 of Environmental Science 1401, and we're going to be looking at chapters 13 and 14 about energy. This is kind of be a little long lecture because it covers a lot of stuff, but we're going to reinforce alternative energies in a separate video. So some of the topics going to be discussing today are going to be what are fossil fuels, because we're going to see this is a major source of energy for running a lot of our society, and then um, what uh, drove us to use fossil fuels. Why do we use it? And then what are some of the environmental impacts? And we're going to briefly look at a couple of the other different types of energy we use just to talk about them in general and then look at the consequences of replacing fossil fuels with these alternative energies later on. And our energy uses, we're looking at a society today which is probably the most intensive energy users of any of the generations ever. And that not, doesn't only include countries like ours, but also even in developing countries, which are finding more and more ways of using uh, non-human labor and animal labor energy like we did in the old days. So um, our demand for energy is mostly to be in the form of fossil fuels. And believe it or not, these were at first a difficult source of energy to find and were basically used out of the desperation from depleted wood sources and these fossil fuels also to help the technological revelation of in several areas that further encourage the use of fossil fuels. So when we look at a fossil fuel, it's an ancient source of carbon from the from basically if you look at um coal from ancient freshwater swamps that contains the bodies of animals, not dinosaurs, but you know certain types of animals, but mostly plants. And then when we look at um, um, oil, that means like what petroleum is made of, um, these come from usually inland oceans or deep oceans, which they still come from today, and usually associated with some type of salt. And, they're, and that is basically made from the bodies of dead microorganisms, particularly algae. It's basically an oil extruded from the dead bodies over time. So these are two different sources of fossil fuels. And generally what we do is we burn them just like we did wood in a very traditional way. So when we look at fossil fuels, almost 80% of the energy we use comes from fossil fuel. And that means the energy in transportation, in, in running a house, producing electricity, and running machinery in general. So I just want to cover briefly, you know, what are fossil fuels and, you know, and eventually we're going to learn why do we get to use these as we go further on in, in discussing our energy needs. So um, basically fossil fuels are an energy source we refer to as hydrocarbons and it just means the chemistry of these broken down plants and animals or these microorganisms um, that are plankton and algae particularly. And a hydrocarbon is basically related to your own chemistry. I mean, we can turn our own bodies into fossil fuels if we wanted to. It'll be kind of gross in a way and it'll take a long time. We can make hydrocarbons artificially. So that means whatever nature makes, we can do it and probably quicker. Because in nature, these deposits take hundreds of millions of years to develop, whether it's coal or petrol. And, and that's amazing to think about that we're using something that old. Okay, and these things are still forming, but not at a rate that we could ever collect them and use them. Now to make them artificially, which we call synthetic chemistry, would be too expensive. And we're trying that with biofuels, but we can't get the diversity of products from biofuels right now that we get from these natural fossil fuels, which is why we're probably gonna be using them for a long time. And again, we'll learn more about these a little later on in a later lecture. So again, over literally hundreds of millions of years, what we've seen is these reserves start out, you know, for, for at least, you know, coal in this picture here, basically as an ancient swamp that goes back to what's called around the Carboniferous era when there was lots of trees, lots of swamps. The earth was a wonderful, tropical, humid, miserable place, sort of like Houston, um, except didn't get as cool as Houston and life was abundant. And these, um, these swamps basically died they went under succession and got buried and eventually got sometimes covered with water or other things and the bodies of the creatures decayed. And eventually that under pressure, those carbon compounds 
form coal, very much like the graphite in a pencil, which some of that is actually artificially made, but a lot of that is based on a very hard coal. So associated with the breakdown of um, these materials into coal and petrol too, we get natural gas, which is a, a decomposition product that even forms in swamps currently. Uh, natural gas is related to a, a methane, which is a very big greenhouse gas, which is why when we did these resources out of the ground sometimes, methane is released and we don't always make use of this methane. A lot of times we burn it off or just release it into the atmosphere, which is a very dangerous thing because it could literally um, encourage global climate change and is just a major pollutant in our upper atmosphere. I mentioned uh, earlier oil, what we sometimes call crude, um, can start out under a current ocean or an ancient ocean that dries up, like is what's shown here, and oceans do. We had oceans that ran through the middle of the United States, and some parts of the East Coast were underwater at one time. I mean, Houston definitely was. You know, and we can tell by um, land formations, ocean formations, coral growth, and even fossils. You can find oceanic fossils all the way up to Montana, out to West Texas. It's really interesting, but these old beds, a lot of them ended up trapping a lot of the algae and these microscopic plankton, which are present by the hundreds of tons, you know, in the water. And they just get crushed again, just like with coal, and become these oil and natural gas deposits. So we can look at oil, we can look at coal and see there's a very similar processes but different times of the earth, basically, this was going on, and also different chemical compositions based on the, what we call the parent material, okay? And that makes a big difference. And understand that these were unknown resources to people. The only thing people knew about coal was when they accidentally came across superficial coal. That means coal that was close to the surface. And this was very typical in China, one of the first people that we believe found and made use of coal. And then we also know from tar that bubbles out of coal, uh, I mean, oil reserves sometimes. I should put that up there, but oil reserves. And that tar at one was recognized by ancient people. They use it for burning on a stick because the tar would burn for a long time. And the and, uh, ancient people, particularly the Romans, use them to pave roads and roofs just like we do today. So these materials were known, but they were very difficult to get. And, we, and they, they didn't do what wood did for us at the time, particularly for the technology that we had. So there's two terms we have to be aware of, is um, the term, the general term called a resource. It means something, anything that we can probably make use to, as a use of as a society. So it just means something that's out there that may have some benefit for us. And there are resources right now that we don't take advantage of, particularly when it comes to agriculture and many, many plants out there that we could be eating that we don't, that are inexpensive to grow and provide very high protein content. But again, we just, you know, we just avoid them because we have no reason or desperation to use them at the time. And this is also typical of energy sources. Like even today, alternative energies are not, uh, we're not desperate enough to be using them yet. And we have resources out there, like we'll learn a little later, piezoelectricity, which we don't make use of yet. We can produce electricity from just putting pressure on a very specialized mineral material. Another term you have to pay attention to is a term called reserve. That means this is something that we know is a resource. We know it. And they can be conventional reserves, and that means they're easy to obtain, or an unconventional reserves, which means they're difficult to contain and to obtain. And this is important because at one time, guys, coal and petrol were unconventional resources. They were novel. They had no purpose and were too expensive to use and couldn't be used for many applications. And today that is kind of now reversed that these unconventional resources of fossil fuels replace the traditional what we call biomass fuels. It means like wood and has replaced human labor and animal labor as a way of getting things done and even replaced early attempts at water energy and solar energy and thermal energy from underground volcanoes. So it's really interesting as time passes on what becomes conventional and what becomes unconventional. But understand cost is a factor. 
we don't want to pay too much for resource or spend too much time digging it up that becomes also cost ineffective and, and, and just very inconvenient. So I'd like you to go through this PowerPoint slide uh, as part of your study, and this picture is also in your book. When we started looking at how fossil fuels compare to other energy, at least the United States at this point in time, because we tend to be heavier fossil fuel users than other countries that have our uh, technological development. So when we look at the use of petrol, which petrol is part of what comes out of crude oil, it's just one product uh, out of refining. And again, later on, we'll go into this in a little more detail. So petrol still makes up a significant sector. And if you break down petrol, a lot of it is used for transportation, and particularly today where transportation has increased as we're spending more time shopping from home. And as you learned in your food transportation assignment, growing food that is grown far away, not that far away as some of you, you know, said in your assignment, but because we still try to grow as close as we can to reduce transportation costs. But when, when the price of fuel goes down though, it becomes easy to transport longer distances as long as the food doesn't spoil. Okay, and that is always a difficulty, but industry uses a lot, but actually per capita, people probably use the most per person is in our standalone houses. And this is, a, and, and also our individual cars. When, it, when we start looking at transportation, um, we can look at natural gas, which is a byproduct of fossil fuels and is also a good resource and usable reserve in itself. And again, we see a distribution of duties for that. It's used a little differently than petroleum. A lot of um, this is used in industry, it's used in, in households. And then we can look at the usability of coal, which is the smaller of the fossil fuels, but at one time used to reign supreme. And then we can look at what's called renewable energy. And this includes stuff that we can bring back. These are non-renewable. That means in a typical human society's lifespan, we cannot make these or replenish them as fast as we use them. And that's why it's important to slow down on their use. Or by 2100, you'll probably have none left. I won't have to worry about it, but I think that's important to pay attention to. Um, but with renewable, these are things that if we use them wisely, we can replace them or replenish them or regrow them pretty quickly. And that can include trees for burning wood or, you know, various other resources. Okay, we can look at solar, we can look at wind, all those resources that we don't really use up. We can impede with them and we compete with those resources for other things. Like if you're gonna set up a solar farm, you're gonna have to maybe chop down a forest if you had to, or you can replace farmland and then you're losing that solar energy to go for other purposes. Now, the other big one we usually let stand alone is nuclear, because this is big, it's much bigger uh, in other countries than it is here, particularly Europe. If you ride the Euro around, you'd be taking a tour of everything, nuclear power plants in every country. So understand that we have usages. And the problem is, is that we are stuck in this world where we built all of our modern technological society, most of us have, at least throughout the world, on fossil fuels, which cannot be replenished within our lifetime that we know right now, or can't be replenish at an economically feasible cost. So guys, you'll notice that there's a diagram here that's kind of set 200,000 years of human history onto a 24 hour clock. And just to give an idea of how recent, you know, fossil fuel use is, if you think about 200,000 years and 24 hours, uh, the equivalent time that we've been using fossil fuels is about 15 sections as a seconds as a fraction of the time of, of energy usage. And what's amazing about this, with this tiny little amount of time that we've used fossil fuels, we've come to the point of depleting them, you know, having to find substitutes for them. And also we've polluted our earth with them, particularly contributing to greenhouse gases, not only through the use of these fuels, but also through uh, the processing of them and, the, and the getting them out of the ground. I just want to briefly go through the history of how we obtained energy and, and
our energy usage is usually follows very traditional patterns. Most of our energy is put into using something to work a simple machine like a pump, a lever, um, some type of wheel, you know, just what you've learned about basic machinery, maybe somewhere in your education. So um, the first resource we use is energy, particularly when people were still nomadic and living in ancient societies was basically human energy or human power, which we sometimes call manpower, but not named after man, but after the term, the Latin term manus, which means by hand. So hand power, okay, manpower, whatever you want to call it, human power was the basic energy for thousands of years throughout human history. And today it still is. Um, so when I would travel overseas, I would still see, you know, carts being drawn by people and people doing a lot of work that today we use fuels for and also we use animals for. And I've also seen a lot of animals put to use. Um, you know, a recent trip to um, Median Columbia, I saw this guy pushing a, well, pulling a giant fruit cart. I mean, he was a, he probably was a farmer and dragged this giant darn thing of fruit behind him and was selling the stuff off the cart. It was really interesting because I'm, you know, asleep and my room was, you know, windows were open because where I was staying was an air conditioner. I heard this guy screaming and I went down and had breakfast, but it was still, I was just amazed that even in a technological city like Medellin to see that type of stuff. So human power became very political. A lot of it associated with people exploiting their own people. Ex, uh, the people power became the exploitation of being a, 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 um, a consequence of being captured during war. It also led to systematic slavery in many cultures. Okay, and, and, and many cultures have a history of using humans as slaves by taking over areas or again as the spoils of war. So human power technologies for the most in the earliest times were used mostly for agriculture and transportation. And um, humans, early humans did burn what we call biofuels. That means like peat moss and wood and um, even cow dung, animal dung in general, that's poop, okay, as a way of mostly deriving warmth and light and heat. They also used it for cooking. I see, I still see this uh, when I travel overseas, uh, particularly in Asia and parts of the, um, what we would call the Near East, not the Middle East, but um, where people are using animal feces for cooking with. And when I was in the Netherlands, I got to see animal poop being used to warm greenhouses. It was placed in a basement and it produced a lot of heat to grow tulips, particularly throughout the season. So, you know, human energy was a major source of energy. Fuels in themselves were limited. They couldn't run machinery. They couldn't move something. So please understand this, that we have this level of history and we still see it today evident in, in migrant farm workers and construction trades and other jobs where it's cheaper and just more feasible to use humans in place of machinery. As people settled and we started developing agricultural systems, we started making more use of animal energy. And this was called, this sounds kind of stupid, but the animal energy uh, um, uh, era. We went from human to animal. And animals, we measured them basically in units of animal power. The term that still sticks around today is horsepower to compare how many horses it took to replace a human. And we now look at it today as a way of saying how much petrol a car uses or a machine uses or something uses in the form of energy. But we had oxen power. We had other things. Uh, um, some cultures had, you know, pig power or whatever. But but these units of en classical energy are still around today with its animal period. Dogs were used a lot for energy and, and you know, the, some of the traditional things we think about as being work animals. So this started about with the advent of agriculture, actually a little later than agriculture, about 7,000 years ago. And we relied heavily on animals. We also started developing more complex machines that can harness nature like flowing water and windmills. 
which go back to antiquity and actually worked pretty darn well for small local energy, you know, production. So a lot of these alternatives at the time and animals were great when things were nearby, villages were small, and 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 people were left free to do other work besides farming and producing energy using their own bodies. So just to repeat is I'm not going to have you calculate energy and all of that mathematically. And we do use terms like watts or joules or joules. I've heard different ways of pronouncing it, depending on what country you're in or who's saying it. But this whole idea of power is very important because it produces this stuff we call work, which is a unit of you know, basically force moving over a period of time or doing some type of, you know, job. So we have these units and we can relate these units to how much work a person could put into a typical cat task, which would be 100 watts per person for a particular job. And cattle could be, you know, three times that again. So energy units were based on classical ideas of work that means turning a wheel producing movement moving a lever um tugging you know tugging a carriage or a boat because in the early days guys bolts were sometimes pulled when they were inland were pulled by animals to get them through narrow paths and rivers sometimes so the idea of movement again is a very important principle when looking at how we use things. And we're going to learn later that what fossil fuels allowed us to do was provide lots of energy to provide movement of different types of machines that we were currently using that were run by animal and plant and and basically biofuel. That means tree, you know, burning trees and things that just died, that type of power. So I'm not expecting to read this whole PowerPoint, but I think what's important is this graph right here. And I know it's a little difficult to read, but the way you got to look at this is you look at, um, you know, the 1700s, whatever, or early, you know, or it could be 1600s, but primarily 1700s for the United States at least, is that we see that when we look at um, wood, it made up 100%, almost 100% of energy usage, and the other 10% came from certain types of oils that we were already using for minimum purposes. Because don't forget, we didn't, you know, petrol and coal were buried under the ground and very difficult to get. And wood powered machinery was able to at least help us to, to extract coal. Human power did not. I mean, in some countries, like, you know, Middle Eastern countries and in China, in the areas where they had large labor pools, people mined. Some of the largest mines were done in China, literally using hundreds of thousands of people, working themselves to death, basically. To do this and and a lot of cultures used slave or slave or criminal labor to do that or people that were captured during wars so wood by becoming very prominent right around this time in the industrial revolution allowed us to run heavier machines than animals and humans can do because what we did was we burned the stuff and and used it to make steam or to heat that can move machinery once we figured that out we developed this thing called a turbine which is very much like a windmill or a fan. And you can spin a fan with enough energy at a very high speed to do a lot of work. So it's basically a wheel that we can put to work. And that's what allowed us to even develop electricity was understanding of the spinning object going through wire, you know, hooked up to wires in the right conditions can produce electrical current. Okay. So this was the wood era all the way to about here. And then when we start looking about, you know, the later 1800s, we use wood mach burning machinery to dig up coal and coal became more feasible, required less people, more machinery, less animals. When I was in um, uh, Mexico in San Luis Potosi and visiting some of the silver mines just because I was there to do work, but I was given some time to take off and go around. Uh, uh, different places um, and it was amazing to see how even the, the silver mines were designed back in those days 1600s for human and animal power some of the buildings even had staircases that donkeys and carts can roll up to get upstairs to, to uh, 
you know, work with the materials, the silver and the other materials, the coal, whatever they were digging up. And then in the newer mines, it was definitely machinery driven. So right around the later 1800s, we started finally getting a hold of coal because it could burn better than wood. And wood was actually on a decline to the point where we were running out of it. And that was all part of the establishment of the national park system too and other things. And, and a lot of people that were using wood were going through this throughout the world and some countries are still today. They're using up every piece of wood they can because they don't have access to coal. It's either not in their country and or they just can't afford to bring it in. Coal eventually gave us the energy to go for petrol. And petrol over time started becoming the dominant energy. It was definitely, look what happened to wood. It's a tiny little sliver, okay? Some of the other natural oils are tiny little sliver. Coal decreased. Now petrol exceeds coal. And eventually natural gas over here starts taking in but maintains stable over time. And these are all your alternatives. But notice that today, petrol is still a significant source of energy and coal. Today, petrol is mostly the most versatile one. Coal is usually reserved for electricity production because it's still cost effective, whereas petrol is not good for doing that, even with natural gas. So think about this. We went through this evolution over a period of time where we really, really were able to build these large congested cities and have transportation that can go across the world by exploiting coal and other fossil fuels. And this is where we stand today. And guys, and don't look at other countries and say, wow, that country does not use these things. They are in the Stone Age, basically. And there's a reason. One reason is that they don't want to develop. The other reason is that it's too expensive for them to get these resources. Or if they have them, they have to sell them to stay alive and they can't use them themselves. So countries that didn't have access to coal or petrol literally were condemned to not having a lot of machinery. And in some cases, that's probably better, but it didn't allow them to build the huge cities unless colonialists came in. Other countries came in like, like Europe and America actually did in Africa, South America, literally all over the world, all over parts of Asia. And we brought in the resources to do that. Of course, when the countries get angry at us and they and we leave or we're forced to leave, those resources don't pour in anymore. And those poor countries can't maintain that infrastructure. And it either crumbles apart or they have to pay a lot of money to keep it. And guys, I do have to say that why have we gotten ourselves into this fossil fuel rut? And a lot of it is economic influence and your part is supply and demand. This is consumer driven. We know this from automobiles is that at one time when gas was expensive or hard to get, not all cars burn gas and cars were not popular. When gas goes down, cars become popular. When gas is really cheap, we tend to not care about the gas mileage of a car. When I have to live through the 70s oil crisis, what's called the OPEC crisis, we had oil shortages where I couldn't afford and couldn't even get gas for my car. I mean, I didn't use my car much in New York City, but we needed it for family business. We weren't taking joy rides in it. And we would sometimes have to haul stuff on a city bus to get it to our store, you know, because we couldn't run the van or the station wagon. So it was really bad times. And people started opting for cars that got more fuel efficiency. And now that petrol is cheap, again, we don't worry too much about fuel efficiency except related to air pollution, but not so much the cost of petrol. You go to other countries and you see energy efficient cars that are tiny and not as powerful as ours because gas to them is sometimes five times more because they're not involved in the production of it or the, or the refining of it. And it's very difficult for them to get and it's very expensive in general for them to have. So they deal with without it. They learn to deal without it. So guys, like I said, a lot of Europe, America, and parts of Russia, parts of Asia, particularly, you know, particularly China, we lucked out. We had access to resources and most importantly to reserves 
usable reserves, conventional reserves that were just right under us. They were available. And we had the people power to do it, to get these out of the ground. And eventually when we started obtaining coal, if you were able to, you could use coal to build, to make steel, to do all sorts of things, incredible things. I mean, you can't build steel structures without coal. You can't make hard things out of hard metals. You can't bake bricks to incredible temperatures and, 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 and make uh, what are called alloys. A lot of alloys we use today, that means metal mixtures and carbonated metals. So this is incredible what we can do. We can build this incredible infrastructure that also makes us more resource dependent for things out of the ground. And coal also allowed us to extract petrol. So this is what's beautiful about looking at the economic forces. And once, it's, once you start building up a civilization, that justifies the costs of getting and putting money into more efficient fuels. And, and guys, just one thing I'd like you to do, it's a very interesting story and a very interesting principle is what's called Javon's uh, um, paradox or Yevon's paradox, however you want to pronounce it. Again, it varies from country to country. Okay based on the native speaking of his name. So he recognized, guys, that as, um, you know, when we start consuming energy, okay, and energy becomes more available and cheaper and things become more energy efficient, that doesn't improve, decrease our use of energy. So when things become more energy efficient, it's funny, we tend to use more. Now, that sounds kind of stupid because you think if we made an energy efficient car that got less gas mileage, that would decrease our need for gas. But we found out with consumer markets, it actually increases its usage and the use goes up, which really screws up the supply and demand market because then it jacks around the prices of supply and demand up and down. And what happens is we use it up, it becomes scarce, the price goes down, then we use it again. So this is really kind of funny. So, and guys, this is not a cost thing for Javon's paradox. It's the fact that um, when we have things that are more energy efficient, we're not saving money. We're not taking advantage of that benefit. We tend to use it more. And that's weird, but it's typical of our type of society, particularly amongst upper class people. This principle works the best. And guys, and governments going back to millennia, and particularly the technological governments that were forming during this end of the Middle Ages, we recognized that we had to somehow put limits on energy usage and a lot of resources. And this involved anything from regulations to reduce, believe it or not, early pollution, would you believe that, to making sure it doesn't get used up, conserving them, to distributing them to importance sources like military or industry gets energy first before houses. So this has always been an issue with resource is government regulation to control these and particularly with fossil fuels. This becomes a global problem because most a lot of fossil fuels are not used in the countries that produce it. And sometimes we are subject to paying or waiting for that supply from other countries and we have very little control over that and have to set regulations that predict political things going on, particularly outside of our country. Another thing that a lot of governments do is we deal with these issues called subsidies. That means when there's a public good that we see as a need or a want that we find very important and very acceptable is, is we look at these things as public goods, which means a government will sometimes subsidize a, country, a company to sell the product or resource for at value, and then the company gets the profit through the government giving them subsidies or giving them tax breaks. And this is unfortunately true for petrol. We give incentives or subsidies to keep the price of petrol down. Now think about Javon's principle, is that that doesn't, making it cheaper and things more efficient does not decrease its use or stabilize its use. It makes its use go up, which this then becomes a problem. And then we have to penalize people or 
tell the companies we're not giving you subsidies and they jack up the price. So this is a constant fluctuation of political systems, consumerism that look at the ups and downs of fossil fuel costs and, and fossil fuel availability and production and what, you know, every aspect about it. Now guys, the, the major problem when we look at fossil fuels, obviously in this course, course is the pollution, the big P word. So when we, you know, yes, there is a convenience to it and blah, 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 blah. And we're not gonna get rid of fossil fuels just because of pollution, but we have to look at ways of controlling the pollution, reducing it. And, and we know that fossil fuel pollution can harm people, but also if, the politicians or policymakers accept global climate change, this is a big factor in global climate change too. And so we're always talking about clean resources like clean petrol, which is very difficult you know, to make, particularly like diesel. We have this concept called clean coal. So what does it mean to be clean? A lot of it means that it could burn more efficiently, which means it produces less carbon dioxide emissions, or sometimes other types of pollutants, particularly with coal. We can remove things like sulfur. We'll learn about that when we talk about pollution. We can learn, remove nitrogen compounds from it. So there are impurities in coal and petrol that make it dirtier than it has to be. And we can remove that, but the thing, it comes at a cost. And guys, we can even dig up clean resources, but those are very scarce. But when we do dig up dirty ones, it should be our responsibility to clean them up to make them burn less dirty. So there is going to be no way of doing perfectly clean fossil fuels because you're going to be producing atmospheric pollutants no matter what and a lot of heat and side contaminants. So guys, what you see here, and I can't tell the color if it's red or orange, but what you see here are areas that has a lot of coal production and usage too actually so when we look at the reserves of coal notice africa none south america very little a lot of middle east this is coal not oil this is funny because in order to get access to petrol you need coal and notice some of the big petrol producing areas they had no access to it until other countries came in with the technology to do it and gave these places an economic boom, but also it was horrible because these countries ended up being taken over for that resource. But look at where the coal is. Now the problem is where you see the coal, these countries have historical use of coal, which means a lot of pollutant for about pollution for about 300 years. Okay, you see a lot of land destruction from mining the coal because it is a dirty business but you also see an economy that's based on coal. But notice the unequal distribution. And I think this is very important to understand when we look at the economic development of countries and why we, you know, became wealthier nations and were able to do economic development. And it also includes India and China, believe it or not. They just took a little while because of philosophical reasons more than anything else. They didn't have the big developmental approach that we did in Americas and in Europe and parts of Northern Asia. So guys, please go through your book, particularly when you look at coal, because it is an important one for our area and we don't dig it up as much as use it a lot. <coughs> Excuse me, for electrical production. So coal is stripped out of the ground or dug out of the ground and it is an environmental hazard. And once a coal mine is used up, you have to spend years Remediating it, remediating it or supporting the lands where the digging was done to keep it from collapsing. And when I was in, doing graduate work in Colorado, I got to see some mountaintop removal mining that my classes, because we were actually ecology classes, we protested. It was kind of fun being part of a protest and whatever. We were protesting the mining companies for doing this type of destructive work that produced not only a loss of soil, but air pollution and a lot of water pollution, which I was helping to study. This is showing a sinkhole or what we call subsidence. And sometimes underneath mines, the ground will break through. And I've actually seen this in Illinois. This have, it split a person's house in half. And where I was um, 
teaching a, a, a university the town was just literally sinking like this in bits and pieces because most of the town was on was on top of coal mines that's what made these areas so understand there's a lot of structural damage besides the pollution that can uh, go along with when we do mining now guys look at the petrol distribution okay some countries are lucky like us you know Russia Soviet Union in and is that they have both coal and oil but now look at some of the countries that have oil but no coal which meant they can't get this out of the ground and this is you know again was a problem historically so we could actually provide ourselves with all the resources we need except that we're using them up faster then we can produce them within our own borders. So we buy from other people that we assumed at one time weren't using them. So we are stuck in a rut where, you know, we have to transport these resources in many cases. And some places are sitting on more resource than they need. But eventually that might change as their populations grow or their development grows. And they start being as urbanized as we do. So this is an incredible unequal distribution that, cre that requires global, and I'm not gonna say cooperation, but tolerance to get a hold of these reserves and resources. And, and for today, at least, when we look at the Middle East, they were at one time had no need at all for the petrol within them and they didn't, beneath them, and they didn't really have the ability to get it out because they didn't have coal machinery to do it or the manpower to do it. So look at this, 55% of the material still comes from the Middle East. That a lot of times when you look at oil producer nations, they call the shots on a lot of this, them and parts of Africa and also parts of South America. So, so guys, the biggest problem we have with oil and even with a shallow mine is the stuff is in the ground it's sealed in rock that you have to drill through. And sometimes that rock is very deep or the stuff is off in the ocean. So you find these big puddles of Petro <coughs> encased in, you know, basically rock or salt or something. And that could be buried, you know, um, deep underground where you have to drill it out. And this stuff is under pressure that means once you get to it, man, it will force its way out sometimes and then it slows down and you can't suck it out of the ground. You can't, you have to pump stuff into it to get it out. You can't suck it out of the ground because it's so difficult to produce a vacuum to get that out of the ground. It's very thick stuff. And sometimes this is covered by ocean and then land and then found in a deep reserve. And this is why we haven't found probably all the oil yet in the oceans because it's buried so deep. And the oceans are so huge, we haven't found all these deposits yet. And a late friend of mine who served on an environmental committee with me, he was actually a petroleum explorer in the Gulf. Now, he was also into preserving the Gulf, but he also did it in a way that still allowed us to get oil. And he discovered right bef uh, you know, before he died um, a new reserve for Brazil that was never discovered before that could be tapped into for who knows the next 22 years. And that means for cost, a cost effectively, because some oil is still too expensive to get out of the ground to do this. So oil is a very difficult thing to work with. And, and, and it's not everywhere, understand that. And it does take special pumping to force it out of the ground. So guys, one thing to remember too, that we've been pumping oil and digging coal a heck of a long time and we're starting to get desperate for different types of, you know, reserves. And to, to, we're trying to get into reserves that are maybe barely affordable to get out of the ground right now. And this is where we come upon something that I'm sure you've heard in the news, what's called fracking or what's called hydraulic fracturing. I don't know where they got the fracking from, but whatever. And um, this is a way that we literally find petrol that's stuck in the rock. And basically they, I mean, and you and literally you can't push it out of the ground anymore with conventional methods. So they use basically these jet engines to put high speed, high pressure steam into the rock and it cracks the rock open and releases the oil so that it can come up. 
And the other thing we can do is um, use these deposits called tar sands, because tar is a form of oil that leaks out of the ground. And we could also steam this out of the ground too. Now the problem is these, these processes are destructive to the environment and, and it's created a whole bunch of problems that um, may be directly or indirectly associated with it, including water contamination and possible human-induced earthquakes. So this is to keep reserves available for us. This is consumer-driven people, I want you to understand. Companies are trying to find us anything possible at a reasonable cost and to make sure that we have some stored away that's available so that it's affordable later on when when oil does get low again, particularly those that are uh, products that are imported. The problem with um, when you get oil out of the ground too, and it's kind of neat because when I fly a lot, I fly a lot, I used to fly a lot until COVID, but um, it would really be neat flying over parts of Texas, the Midwest, and other places and seeing these from the airplane, going, what the heck is that? And those are basically oil extraction fields. And these would go to pipelines that can travel up to you know several thousand miles. And unfortunately that has to be done because the oil that comes out of the ground, it's, it's just too much to deliver by truck and whatever. It's very difficult to work with. So it's best to be piped. And a lot of the chemicals are piped either underground or above ground depending on the geology or the, the area. And this slide takes us back to fracking because these are the reserves that are, you know, we're digging into that probably will have to be piped and channeled somewhere. Uh, and also the tar sands because they're in, you know, pretty remote areas a lot of the time. And um, again, this is, you can see the unit here and read about it, is that this is a totally different process that literally cracks the rock. And think about that if you're living above that or near it or there are, or if there are uh, aquifers or waterways that are near there i mean it is a destructive process but again a lot of this is consumer driven by supply and demand and for the desire to have inexpensive fossil fuels and this picture always amazes me and i love getting a hold of these maps when i can this is showing pipeline maps just across the United States. And you see this in other countries too. And you see some of these pipelines literally going under, you know, under bodies of water to get from place to place. And sometimes along highways, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, I have a property where we have a pipeline that runs literally right on our property, right as part of our property. And we can't, you know, we have to be careful around it and also make sure we don't do anything around that pipe that can disrupt it or block it from being worked on. So this is amazing how we pipe things through. And there are people whose sole job is to distribute these to different areas and, and control the flow based on supply and demand and getting this oil where it needs to be for either processing or just to transport for storage. Now, of course, another downside of uh, fossil fuels is basically accidents, disasters. We hear about oil spills and guys, millions of gallons of crude are lost on just the oceans every year in different locations. These, I mean, there are what are called natural oil, you know, oil field leaks, which occur underwater and on ground just in the geology of these things as they're old structures that are subject to cracking and, and, and failure. But man, we have increased the load and 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 guys and the, and the transport of this is it can cause problems too uh, even with coal guys coal burning plants tend to have a lot of explosions they've killed many more people than nuclear reactor failures so when we look at the whole business of fossil fuel it is a dirty business and and converting the fuel into other resources is a very dirty polluting business and accidents do occur so guys our, our continual reliance on coal, oil, and natural gas, isn't it? it's going to eventually kill us. And, I, and a slow death, economic death, is if we're not prepared to move into a future that is not using these resources. And, you know, we're looking at shortages in 2050, you know, of to the point where it gets to be scarce and expensive. And we don't want to have to live like other countries where these are where we can't have a fossil fuel dominance, but we'd have to have some replacement for that.
to allow us to run our current technologies, but maybe in a cleaner way. And biofuels are not going to be the answer because they still produce CO2. Even though it's a cleaner pollutant, it's still burning something. And we're going to have to look at options beyond that eventually, unless we could just accept a certain level of environmental damage due to replacement fuels. So what do we look for? We look for options. And this is particularly true in developing nations where they're scrambling either as individual households or as governments to look for alternatives like solar, wind, whatever. And sometimes people actually get in trouble for setting up their own little energy systems because governments like to have control over that. And I've been in places where the government ran, you know, diesel generators to fuel the place and it would break down all the time because the government wasn't taking care of it and the people weren't allowed to. So um, there's a big politics because energy makes money. And this is important. And petrol companies are going to hold on to their terrain. And some of them are even looking into the future and looking at exploiting alternative energies to eventually make up for once fossil fuel is on its way out. So the petrol companies are looking into the future on this. And they're going to be the ones that will probably have the money right now to help develop alternative energies. So I do want you on your own to read about you know, wind power, what's its limitations? And we know you can pour a lot of money into this resource right now and it's not cost effective. Right now it's subsidized. And this is the kind of thing that's gonna be difficult to do on a long distance scale. That means you can't set up a windmill here and expect to transport that resource as far as you're gonna transport fossil fuels. So we're gonna to have to be looking at local initiatives very much like in the early days of Thomas Edison, where power plants had to be very within a couple of miles next to where the electricity was needed. Of course, AC current made that difference, but there's still a distance that electricity can travel. So we're going to have to be looking at local initiatives for wind power. And wind power, to get it going, it is material resource intensive. It does require upkeep. And these things do, they can be dangerous if in the wrong area for particularly birds. And they can cause, we don't know yet, some environmental disruption. We don't know. But we do, they're not dangerous, they're not polluters, but the process of making them too could be polluting. So we have to really be careful about the cost, benefit, and practicality of wind power. And think about wind power too, we're going to have to learn to get these things much more effective and efficient to produce more power because they will be local and we can't really use too much land. So we have to find, have a, find, a way to find these or develop these, these what are called wind farms that they're not such a big footprint. And I've seen some in different places and they still, for the most part, take up a fair amount of land if you're going to produce a lot of electricity. Now solar is the other option and there's a lot of different types of solar. We always think of solar cells, but it's also just using direct sunlight to heat water or to heat a building or, you know, whatever. The same is true. We could use wind power to cool a building. You see that a lot in the screen in buildings in the Middle East. But when we look at solar power, we're thinking of people like Elon Musk, who I did get to meet and hear him talk a couple of times in person, uh, mostly related to space industry, SpaceX. But um, the thing is, is that panels and the other devices used with solar you can only do during the day just like with wind there's only certain times of day in certain places that can be set up so it's, it would be hard to do solar in extreme polar regions or in northern canada or you know asia and even in the south uh, southern hemisphere runs this too where sometimes you have months where there's very little sunlight and not enough to power a solar generator so you have to talk about having backups, um, batteries to store during the night, so you have some power available to you. And some of the materials that are in photovoltaic cells are very toxic. I was once given a talk for um, a, a March for Science group. Uh, it was a dinner talk. We actually had outside of a restaurant, and I was talking about the reality of global climate change gases, what they do. And we had another speaker who was talking about voltaic cells, a guy from Rice University. And he was talking about how dangerous they were and that he was developing 
these biological cells, what we call organic cells that are not toxic and actually recyclable safely. But the thing is that they were very expensive and still not practicable. They didn't produce a lot of power. So solar does have its limitations, but it, uh, and, and particularly, you know, again, with the heavy resource nature of this technology. Again, read through your book, there are different type of systems. This is more of a passive system where you could have a heat, a solar heat collector that warms up water and the water is used to produce energy or get stored. So you have shower water that could also, you know, um, be pumped back up to cool and recycle. So, you know, there's different types of systems that we can have when we look at solar. There's not one type of solar. So you have to be careful when you argue about the whole idea of using solar. And probably the smartest thing would be to have several types of collectors, both a solar cell and these uh, water heater collectors to help produce electricity. But solar power is going to also be one of those local powers that you can't transmit this too far and you can't produce the megawatts that you can from a coal plant or a nuclear plant. So most of the initiatives I've seen have been personal and local, like you have solar farm that runs a small village or helps to support a community or helps to supplement the electricity in a factory or commercial entity. State parks use these a lot to run their system. You can use these to run traffic lights and all these little bits and pieces save. But the thing is they take up space and these have a lifespan that they have to eventually be recycled or thrown out. And unfortunately, recycling of these is very deadly and unfortunately get shipped overseas that have lax environmental regulations where the pollution from recycling these is not regulated and it's nobody cares. It's very expensive to recycle them here. So this would be mostly local initiative, but believe me, all of this can wean us off a lot of the use of petrol and coal. So if we can get solar that's a little more effective, a little cheaper and a little long lasting and easier to recycle and reuse, this would be beneficial. And the same is true for wind that could help supplement and ease us off the, um, you know, the petrol. And we're finding people that are developing, you know, cars that run on solar planes, which kind of scares me still, but there has been a, there is a solar plane that can't carry much, but it's more of an experiment. So just think about these energies and what the limit of these alternatives are as far as replacing petrol, the convenience of petrol and coal and natural gas. The next popular alternative is an ancient one called hydropower. And you can see in order to have hydropower, this is a very destructive alternative in itself. But you have to have a reservoir, either natural or human made, and you have to have a dam that controls the flow of water that turns a turbine which is very typical how motors work, how electricity production works. These are mostly for electricity production. Smaller versions can turn a machine directly, but these big dams you see are mostly hydroelectric. And this works where you have a lot of water and could also dam up the water, which causes environmental catastrophes upstream and downstream. And dams do age and require maintenance and break down. And these do, for the most part, a large dam can produce enough electricity to pump long distance along high power poles. The problem is you have to have high power poles up to sometimes 200,000 volts to get these babies moving and to get the electricity long distances. So hydro, again, is dependent on weather. You have to have rain to rejuvenate these reservoirs or a flow of a river, but then that upstream has to have weather that's conducive to this. So there's a lot of limitations again. And this is generally going to still be local. We're not going to speak, see hydro pumping electricity incredibly long distances. I will say countries that are traditionally big coal and petrol uses are moving towards hydro when they can. And you're seeing a lot of this in China. Uh, and they've had some really controversial products, uh, projects building dams for hydro and also to assist with other features too, agriculture, but it's been flooding areas, draining other areas and covering up uh, cultural areas, that, you know, thousand, several thousand year old cities. But you've seen a lot of this in um, South America too, where the countries have to go through hydro. And these are countries that have petrol and coal. 
but they know that they have to hold on to that stuff and save that stuff for later or for sale. Now, the last but not least is the geothermal, which I've hardly ever seen. I've been in a couple of areas that use geothermal, but that means we had a lot of volcanic activity. And one time, the volcanic, the, there was actually an active volcano going on, actually two times in my life. And uh, it was kind of scary because uh, the ground was hot, steam was coming out of the ground, I actually melted part of the tennis shoes I was wearing in one situation. And the other situation, this was in Alaska, I got to see the fumes coming out and smell the sulfur fumes. And then hear the rum, feel the rumbling and hear it. And that was kind of scary. Uh, I got out of that area real quickly. Um, but anyway, with geothermal, this is limited to certain areas too. It requires a very usually expensive infrastructure to pump steam into a generator or to use the steam directly, very much like you heat water with solar. So guys, the important thing when we start looking at what are we gonna do with these alternatives? We have to pay attention to how we're using them. Are we using them for cities, using them for transportation? Are we using them to produce heat or steam? I mean, are we making electricity with it? Are we running motors with it? This is all gonna make the decision on how you use this and the cost effectiveness of these. Besides, is this available to me anyway in a sustainable way? Now you're gonna get a very brief on nuke. And then I want you to spend, we're gonna spend some time in an activity looking at the, con the biggest consequence of nukes, which is basically what do we do with the wasted material? And you see a short video on how a nuclear power plant operates and please, you know, that's testable material. So when we look at nuclear, the only thing about nuclear that's different than petrol is that we're using a resource that is very dangerous, it's radioactive, and when we put radioactive materials under certain conditions and confine them, we can produce a lot of heat, like the atomic bomb, and a lot of work. So basically what we do is we take a plant that could normally use petrol or coal and put in a heat producing unit that does the same thing as petrol or coal because they produce heat. Now, for a car engine, this might be a little different, okay, because it's going to take a little, but there have been nuclear cars. I think someone made a nuclear plane once as an experiment. We know nuclear subs work real well. But the thing is, what we're trying to do is either produce electricity or turn an engine of some type. For the most part, nuclear is used for electrical because this is cost effective and it's the safest way to use it. But understand that these are very, compared to coal plants, they're pretty safe and they're also basically don't cost too much more. And when we look at the lifetime of the fuel, we're gonna see that this is pretty efficient. So nuclear has its big downsides. It has a big fear factor, but it's also what almost every government see, is seeing as a future to ease up on petrol and other fossil fuels. So guys, so, so when you look at nuclear power, I want you to think about, guys, one, one little fuel pellet, and you're gonna see this in a video, of nuclear energy is equivalent to like a lot of oil, a lot of coal, and a hell of a lot of natural gas. So it is an efficient resource. And it produces a lot of energy per unit size. And that's true for the same, uh, it's the size of a power plant too. We could have much less power plants to be able to do this compared to like coal or natural gas plants. Plus guys, the fuel in a nuclear reactor can last 20 to 40 years before it has to be replaced. Now the replacement's a big pain in the butt. And there's a lot of pollution and danger along the way to making and operating nuclear power plants because you have to dig uranium ore in the ground, which is a natural rock. Guys, we have a lot here in Texas, right around College Station area all the way up to uh, Central Texas. There's a lot of this stuff. Uh, in Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada has tons of uranium in the soil that we, we used to collect during the, the Cold War and then after World War II for bombs. But guys, this is stuff that's dug up. As a matter of fact, this is where helium comes from too for the most part. It's collected from uranium processing. Isn't that nice? But the helium itself is not radioactive. It's, I mean, it's pure helium it's not, and it's a non-radioactive form. But usually we go for something called uranium. And there's several types of uranium or even plutonium that we could use. And this stuff has to be purified, what we call enriched, 
and that means concentrated. Okay, uh, it does produce what's called a depleted waste. This stuff is actually called yellow cake. It's then converted to a gas, shipped, and then reconverted for reprocessing. Okay, to be used as a, 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 what's called a fuel rod that goes into a nuclear power plant. And then when the rods are used up, they could actually be recycled and reused. So a lot of this stuff doesn't have to be disposed of. And we're finding more efficient systems. There's not one type of nuclear power plant, there's many, but we're finding more efficient systems that uses less fuel and has a longer lifespan to the fuel. We just have to work out the cost effectiveness of it and of course safety protocols that go with these. But the problem is when we do dispose of it finally, which is little amounts over a period of time, it is radioactive for about 100,000 years. And that's not good. That's dangerous. And we have to put it in facilities that can store it that way, which right now we don't really have a fully active one, except you're going to learn about Yucca Mountain in another activity, which is going to be used. I mean, it's been approved for use. And there are others in other continents, other sites that were, are based on Yucca Mountain that would be storing other you know nuclear power waste because right now it's stored on site and that's dangerous it's stored at the plants or it's stored in repositories that are in their major cities because we can't we can't just throw it in the ground it has to be stored under particular conditions so you're going to learn about the yucca site in nevada not too far from um, las vegas and this was just recently completed you're going to see the history of it because i think that's important to know and we have to have a place to put this stuff. Right now, small amounts of radioactive material have to be stored in drums. And some countries actually took these drums and dumped them into oceans. They buried them uh, inappropriately. And so we have to have some place to put them, particularly the larger amounts that will be coming from nuclear power plants that will be having to recycle their cores pretty soon.